B1 family, welcome to Black Logic. Fear in the United States when it comes to foundational Black Americans, U.S. freedmen, descendants of slaves. When we talk about fear, there has never really been an, um, a, a very honest and broad conversation about fear in the field that we, most of us, essentially has instilled in us. Whether it be many fears or one fear, we have some sort of fear living in this country, but we love this country and we're not going to leave the, the country that we built. We're not going to leave the country that our ancestors built. This is our country. This is the only country that we know. But there's a large amount of fear in different areas within our life. We have fear of being pulled over by the police. We have fear of being killed by the police. We have a fear of being wrongfully convicted of a crime by law enforcement in this country. We have a fear on our job that if we're not two to three times better than our non-black counterpart, we have a fear of being fired. We have a fear of not getting adequate medical attention when we go to hospital and clinics. We have a fear because of the systemic problem in this country that no one values black life. And some people will even argue that black people don't value black life. Thus, the racist trope and narrative of black on black crime. See, what we have to understand is in any race of people, there's different classes. You have your criminal class, you have your poor class, you have your middle class, you have your high class, and you have your elites. You have your millionaires and billionaires. But see, what they do here, because there's a system of anti-blackness in America, they always prompt up and show the most prominent areas within our violent and criminal society, which is essentially only 1% of the 50 million black Americans who are native to this land, who built this land. So when we look at these things, family, this is etched within our very spirit and souls, what the system has put upon us, regardless if you agree with the narrative or not. And a lot of you are saying, I don't fear that, I don't fear this, I don't fear that, because you would like to counter each and everything. Now, some of you may not fear some of those things, but me too being pulled over by the police, fear as though that it will something will be planted or um, I will be mistreated during the stop, even though... I probably didn't even commit a crime. Maybe I changed lanes uh, without signaling. Maybe I was going 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. It's a traffic stop. It's a ticket. Not, not a point where I should be fearing for my life. Because here's the thing. Fear begots fear, right? Fear is like a sickness. It's like a virus that runs through um, any sort of people who on one occasion, our experience, some of the same things, either directly or indirectly. I mean as though your buddy of yours, your friend of yours, your girlfriend of yours ran into a stopping with the police and he disrespected her and said all sorts of racial epithet and she just had to take it. So you're hearing that the next time that you get put over the by the police, you're going to experience fear more so than not. Because someone told you a, a very intimate and, and, and a very tumultuous story about the police instilling fear in them. And, and granted, this is not anti-police. This is not anti-police. This is a conversation about anti-fear in the many ways that Black folk endure fear. See, they will always like to talk about Black American suffrage, Black American situations and what we went through. They always tell us about the turmoils of being black Americans. And we know your ancestors went through slavery and you guys are still uh, being discriminated and biased and violent racial attacks, et cetera. They would tell you all of the atrocities. They would tell you all the scenarios and all the indications and everything that occurred to us down to every last sin that's occurred to our people. And then in that same breath, but aren't you worried about black on black crime, meaning that you fear your own people. What is the counter to those arguments? What about white on white crime? What about brown on brown crime and Asian on Asian crime and et cetera? See, we don't use counter arguments in that we always trying to defend black on black crime, but this is, this is a narrative of fear when you really look at it. And some of the proponents of that fear, Democrats, and Republicans, 
they go hand in hand. Because, you know, Democrats often viewed as champions of social justice have sometimes, if not all the times, dismantled systematic issues that disproportionately affect the black community by exporting the fear of racial injustice on, on every account, racial injustice on every account. And they do this to secure our vote. Because that's the only time we really see the Democrats is during voting time. We see them every two and four years, depending on the uh, the level of and status that the voting block is on, whether it be local, state, or federal. This is what they do. They, they use racial injustice to propel their narrative to have us fearful of a racist Republican Party, and we should vote Democrat indefinitely. Now, I can jump right to it, family. The way that any political party will get majority of the black vote, if not all the black vote, is cash payments reparations. I just wanted to throw that in there. Now, the Democrats never deliver substantial change to us, even though they fear among us every two to four years. They have uh, made certain promises of criminal justice reform, those, those some things that they said can be made. Uh, the, those implementations have failed very short. Wiping away qualified immunity. Would they do it on a federal level? But they understand majority of black people who are encountering the police are not encountering federal police. We are encountering local and state police departments. When the last time you know someone who wasn't up on a RICO charge or was some big, you know, drug kingpin that the federal law enforcement agency was come knocking at your door? The FBI not trying to get the 10 bag and 20 bag hustle on the street. No, those are your local police. That's your local police departments. But these are the things that they push to us, which essentially leave us still disproportionately affected by a flawed system. There are some things that we really need to talk about here, family, because on the Republican side, there is a different but equally damaging approach. Some Republicans have utilized fear of crime and economic insecurity to gain support, which, you know, helps perpetuate stereotypes that vilify black people everywhere in every community, like the police war on drugs, which has disproportionately infected black Americans contributing to a cycle of incarceration and hindering economic advancement. The culture of fear extends beyond politics. It dwells even within our social, our social platforms, social media, our social gatherings. It infiltrates the mindset of black individuals who are striving for success. Those of you who are striving for success, yell out and call out that the reason why you can't achieve success, the reason why you can't achieve your goals is because of white supremacy and systematic oppression. In some regards, we understand that to be true on a very high level. But on a very micro and minuscule level, we understand that is a fear that majority of us will not succeed, which begots fear of you ever trying. See, fear has been a weapon by these political parties for quite some time, and it's been working wonderfully. It's been working wonderfully. One side of the party can tell you about Donald Trump speaking um, ill will, about um, touching you know, women's private parts and saying all sorts of degenerate things. And then on the other hand, that political party displays the racist legislation that affected a lot of black people and displayed that, you know, the straight out racism from the Democratic Party. But because the Democratic Party scared black people so much, We voted Democrat. Now, some people are like, no, I wasn't scared. Is it that I don't think Donald Trump is a good candidate because he's not intelligent enough. He's not well-spoken enough. He's not this. And granted, 
I am I am apolitical. I'm not a Democrat nor Republican. I'm looking at this on both sides because I'm realizing, and this and this came to me yesterday when I was having a discussion online about fear. When, when do we when do we ever care as Black Americans? Don't get me wrong; those who are in some of the high echelons of politics, and we should care to a certain degree. But why are we cr caring about candidates? Do not speak to our special interests. These candidates do not speak to our special interests. I want to look at your neighborhood. I want you to look at your surroundings. I want you, I want you to look at your family members. Are majority of your family members in the middle class or above? Or are you doing well and the rest of your family is not doing so well? Because that's the, that's the vast majority, believe it or not, of a lot of black folk. Now, I'm not stating majority of black people are below the poverty line. I'm not stating that majority of black folk are poor. What I'm saying is we have a higher percentage of poverty in the black community than anywhere else. And, and look how this, this, this two-sided coin is played. On one side of the coin, white people are scared of us. Think about that. They're scared, they're scared of an uprising. They are scared of a revolution. They are scared of a rebellion because of the past, because of the present, and because they know they're not doing anything to better race relations, yet alone pay what is owed to those descendants of the enslaved Africans that you tortured the enslaved Africans that made this country the most powerful country on earth. Everybody comes knocking on America's door. And that did not happen if we don't look at the source. We keep looking at the branches, we keep looking at the leaf, but we're not looking at the root cause of the situations of black Americans. And until this day, they're still using fear as a strategy and tactic to keep us yet again oppressed. But this oppression is much more than you can ever imagine. This oppression is psychological. This oppression is mental. Let's get into it, family. Let's get into it. We don't teach enough about black fear in United States history. No, we do not. No, we do not. Today, politicians across the country are trying in many states succeeding to remove discussion of race and racism from history curriculum for fear that white children will feel guilty to think of themselves as oppressors. In that political context, it is no wonder that black people fear is still rarely taught in the U.S. history classroom. Fear, oppression, yeah, you are the descendants of oppressors. But no one's charging you with that crime. Oh, you're trying to stop your next generation from feeling guilty. Well, do what Germany did. Or do what the U.S. did to Native Americans. Or do what the U.S. did to Australians. Or do what the U.S. did to the Japanese internments. Do what the U.S. did any time they have wronged a people. They have repaired that people monetarily through reparations. So, so it will be okay if you talk to history. Wouldn't it not? It would be okay if you taught the history, but you cut the check. Be because why, why are they feeling guilty? Ger Germans are feeling guilty about the Holocaust, and they cut the check. So why we can't do two things at once? There's a problem in the United States, and they have to deal with black people being in the middle and being fearful. To teach about black fear in the U.S., history will be to acknowledge that the events we celebrate as progress did not eradicate the foundation of anti-blackness on which this country was built. It was built on anti-blackness. Think about a group of people that was almost genocide to the level of extinction, Native Americans. And then provide the history that Native Americans is just not one group of people but there's many tribes of people. And think about another narrative that Native Americans are not only the Mongolian looking red type Asians that came over, but there was also dark melanated 
coarse, beady hair Native Americans as well. But that's so fine. If you don't want to, if you want to throw that narrative, that's practically fine. We can stay with the Mongolian type looking natives. And then being almost genocide and then getting to a point where they made deals, they made some treaties, and then they were able to gain some of their land back that America came and, excuse me, that um, the first pilgrims came and stole. Now I want you to think about another group of people. There was a brought over here in shackles. There was brought over here in change. And until my history, some were already here. And take those people and not only genocide them, okay, almost to the level of extinction, put them to work in intense labor from anywhere from 14 to 20 hours a day, okay? Long as there was daylight, they were working. And even sometimes at night. Not only, let, not only that, torture them for minor infractions of a hardship that you endured with them by stripping them away from their country, stripping away from their people, stripping away from their language, stripping away from their food, Etc. Not only that, rape them, men and women alike, buck break them, really lynch them, like mentally have a toy and psychological control over their minds. This is where the fear started, family. Do you do you understand what I'm stating? This is where the fear started. And even to this day, when they form the so-called park police or the slave patrol, they had they had slave fugitive laws all over this country from cops and police to go in and chase down runaway slaves from California to New York City. It doesn't matter if it was east, west, north, or south. All of these states had slaves. All of these states allowed slavery in all of these states, if, if uh, with the exclusion of Hawaii at the time, had those fugitive laws. Just look it up. But this is where the fear started. Teaching black fear to not be confused with black oppression, but rather an uh, amplification of black humanity. This is important. And I, and I think that the oppression gets mixed in with the fear. There are two different entities. There are two different entities. For examples, when white Southerners are described as fearing in slave rebellions, the standards reference that fear is justification for implementing harsher fugitive slave laws and legislation that severely restricted the rights of free black Americans. Another example describes Southern states fearing that President Lincoln would abolish slavery. The standards refer that fear is justification to succeed from the union. Now you had all these white people at the time doing slavery fearing a slave rebellion, as they should. You enslave an entire race of people based upon their skin color. Then tell them that they're stupid, that they're degenerate, that they're not even human. Well, well, why are we stupid? Because we can't read your English words. Okay, this is back then. We can't read your English words, and then you won't even allow us to read your English word, but we're less than human. And we're, we're incapable of learning. We're incapable of speaking properly. Is that right? On your terms. Even though all these African people from all these different countries that came over here were speaking different languages anyway other than English until the colonization. I noticed that every time the standards focus on the fears of groups of people, that fear served as both a catalyst and a justification for those groups to inflict violence. I find that in how we teach U.S. history, fear is much more than an emotional expression to fright. It goes on, Black suffering with the omission of Black fear strips black people of their humanity while simultaneously rendering them powerless. In trying to understand why students learn about black suffering absent of black fear, I realize that teaching about black fear drastically changes dominant narratives of U.S. history, so much so that it is more too comfortable to talk about the many ways that black people suffered instead of the emotions that suffering proceeds. Yeah, the culture of fear 
steers far beyond politics, family, far beyond politics. The constant exposure to negative narratives that perpetuate self-doubt and at times a fear of achieving, of, of achieving success. That's what we have to understand. A lot of us are fearful of actually being successful because this fear, un, you know, um, unfortunately, has been inherited, has been passed down, has been instilled by the many generations of black folk by the weight of the system of white supremacy. You know it was coming. You knew it was coming. Because some people would like to believe that somehow we just conjured up, we just imagined that things, things occur in our everyday lives, that we don't have brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, cousins and uncles, aunts and nephews. We don't have these people that tell us and who have been through a particular thing within this country, whether it be employment discrimination, bias, being called the N-word, haphazardly out in public having a dispute with somebody and then that turns into a racial feud, you telling someone that they cannot dock their boat because a bigger ship is coming and I am the boat, I'm the dock captain. You guys will get one back in Alabama. You guys remember the story back in Alabama? It is a black man doing his job. It's just a black man doing his job and they proceeded to jump this black male. But what they didn't understand that the black folk in that area of Alabama was on code for the brother. Usually fear stop us. Usually we see something was going on where we're trying to break it up. We're trying to, oh, well, that's not my problem. Fear, we still have fear. And some people would like to use PTSD, post-traumatic slave disorder. But this fear has been passed down in many different forms, and it has been perpetuated In the, in the very different industries of America. Whether it be uh, social programming, police brutality, job discrimination, healthcare discrimination. There's just so many things, environmental discrimination. And on one hand, they would tell us all the ways that black Americans are oppressed. Then they will get black bootlets they will get uh, uh, the puppets of the white supremacist society that have black faces to tell us that this is all imaginary, that none of this stuff is real, that, oh, it happened so long ago that these still things do not exist. The fear black employees carry. While many company leaders may not see it, their black employees are living in existential fear. The January 6th attack on the Capitol, the ongoing police shootings of black people, the senseless pepper spraying the handcuff of a black army officer at a gas station, and even some of the reactions to the guilty verdict of Derek Chauvin, who murdered George Floyd, showed us the voices of racism and white supremacy a lot of the that. What about all the black men who have been caught, um, have been labeled hanging themselves? What, what about that? What about all these um, young black men just being hung randomly or across the U.S. What about um, a race of people picking up black people and shooting them to death? What, what about all these different race soldiers out here? Not, not just the ones with badges, but all the race soldiers. And, and I'm looking at this family. To break this cycle, it's crucial to expose these manipulations and foster self-awareness within our black communities. Understand the historical context and recognizing that fear has been weaponized for political gains, empowering, excuse me, empowering individuals to overcome the imposed limitations and strive for success is the antidote to the culture of fear. And now it's all these other things I'm hearing about that uh, people are just using kind of at these excite words to get clicks and views. Now, they're now saying that black culture is the problem. They're now saying that black culture is the problem. Let me, let me pop this up for you really quickly. Let me, let me define what culture is. Let's just do a little, 
let's just do a little lesson. You know, it's, it's frustrating, family, because it's like we have to keep going over these things to inform and to empower our people. So not that we counteract or um, had these disputes with non-Black people or even with people who look like us so that we have the information so we don't have to have the argument. Now, it's good to um, involve yourself in healthy educational debates where people are open and honest, where there may even be receptive. But if you got somebody who's just trying to um, spew racial narratives and not really listen to what you're saying, you're just wasting your damn time. You're wasting your damn time. So let's let's define what culture is, okay? This is according to Google. It states that culture is a diverse set of intangible aspects of social life. It includes the shared values, practices, and beliefs of a group. Culture is passed down from generation to generation, and it includes arts, beliefs, and institutions. Arts beliefs and institutions so they're they're telling us that all of black culture is the problem out black art is the problem black art black expression is the problem so when you go to an african-american museum and you see beautiful black art whether it be african art or or black american art you're saying that is the problem black art pictures and statues and um, different expressions of art, that is a problem? Okay. Your belief in your religious preference is the problem? You see, a lot of times we have to debunk these things as soon as these people come out with these idiotic, dumbass sort of excite words This to get click and views. Black culture is the problem. Black culture has never been the problem. Black culture is the reason why a lot of these non-white groups have the special privileges and benefits that they have today. Black culture is not the problem. Black culture is the solution. Okay, let's go down here and see what uh, culture means. It says the arts and other manifestation of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively. Art, social institutions and achievements of a particular nation, people and or other social groups like Caribbean culture. If we go into the way Black Americans used to dance before Uncle Luke came over, and by the way, Uncle Luke is from the Caribbean. Uncle Luke is from the Caribbean. And just as a disclaimer, family, I'm just letting you know, a lot of the degeneracy, when you see uh, people twerking on ambulance and police cars, that's not Black culture. That, that, that is not Black culture. Now, people are now believing, okay, that does black culture because it has infused itself. It has meshed itself. It has amalgamated itself into black culture. But if you go, and I hate to say this, I know a lot of you guys are like, what about now? What about now? What about now? A lot of times in order for us to understand the present, we have to understand history. When you go back and you look at black people dancing, they were doing all sorts of dancing, swing dancing, pop dancing, Moon sliding, I mean, to this day. But now people think black culture is just women with big butts dancing on police cars, dancing on slave castles, slave, uh, dancing on uh, tables, the kitchen and cocktails. That's what people th believe black culture is. Some people believe that black culture is hip hop and, the, and some of the degeneracy that hip hop um, promotes and produces. Drill rapping, kill rapping, gangster rap. But no one tells you that black culture, when hip hop first came out by foundational black Americans, that it was an art form of expression, of revolution, of change, of information to transform the minds of our people to be positive and build business and still fight for justice of our people in this country. That's what hip hop started off as. Now, yeah, it has infused itself to a whole nother thing. But then I want you to go look at some of the backgrounds of these people who are now in hip hop that you may believe are black Americans, which they are not. Culture is also food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can agree to a certain point. You can't eat soul food every day. But when we look at culture, period, that is, that is, that is predicated upon the straps 
that came down to slaves from the master's table. The remnants and the remainder of pigs. The worst thing that you can ever give people. So unfortunately, that was instilled in our culture for survival. And yeah, now that we know better, we should do better. But unfortunately, everything doesn't go away like that. It has to be informed. It has to be educated. It has to be inspired. It has to be informed. It takes discipline and sacrifice. All these things. A lot of us still have a fear of being successful. A lot of us have a fear of even trying to be successful. We have a fear of failure. And you, and you think that a, a group of people of all the many achievements that we have accomplished, you think that all of a sudden we just became fearful? Lifestyle, customs, traditions. This is all different parts, all different pieces, all different ingredients of culture. So when, when people tell you that black culture is a problem, ask them what part of black culture you're referring to. Are you stating that the entire culture of black people is the problem? And as I stated on Wednesday, oh, okay, so black culture, so black people making inventions. Um, the first airplane patent before the Wright brothers was a black man who got approved until they stole the brother's plane. That's black culture. That's called inventions. Marion Van Brown, the creator, uh, inventor of the first home defense alarm system in New York. Is that black culture? Because that's innovation. Vivian Thomas. He came up with a procedure to cure the blue baby syndrome. Even Ben Carson was the first successful doctor to separate Siamese twins. Charles Drew, blood transfusion. Frederick, um, I've got the, uh, the gentleman's name, but he invented the first refrigerated truck. So tell me something when you say black culture is the problem. Are you saying all the advances in technology and innovation, all the medical innovations and advancement, are you referring to that, that black culture is the problem? Don't let these people fool you of who you really are and what you really are. See, they understand that they can control, that they can fear black people into their control. You, you see what I'm saying? They fear you into their control. Yeah, we have to play the game on a job. I get it. It's for survival. It's for survival. But there's a, there's a line to be crossed. Now, I was watching a movie yesterday called The 24th. Um, are you guys familiar with The 24th Tribe? I believe there was, um, there was a, either a platoon. There was a platoon of black soldiers who were being discriminated upon. I forgot this. I think it was in Texas. I think it was in Texas. They were, they were still following Jim Crow laws during this time even to the black soldiers. So long story short, there was a night where four black soldiers got killed. And so that black platoon went out and just started killing people. 19 of them were hung and 41 of them um, had life in prison. See, it, it kind of reminds me of Nat Turner and what occurred during that time. And that is probably the fear that white people have, even though they're still the majority. Now, the Hispanics are coming up at a close second, right? It's only 50 million of us. But maybe that is what they fear. They feel that an uprising is coming. Oh, these black people woke. And we understand that when they use that word woke, and I heard black people use it in the same manner, and I'm like, you have no idea what woke is. They use woke as a euthanism for black people. They use woke as a racial trope to describe black people. Why, why would anyone, why would the government was stop you from being aware of the current situation and the social construct and the dynamics that we live in today? Why would the government want you to do that? Because every government, regardless of the democratic republic, a communistic or a dictatorship, wants to control the people. That's just simply what it is. So how do you control a people? You eradicate, you erase 
history. You don't teach it. You keep the public uninformed. Think, I want, okay, think about, it a, think about it a different way. Let's talk about your money. Why don't they teach tax code in high school? We know that majority of Americans go to high school. Majority, uh, the, the, of course, that number is greatly decreased when it comes to college, right? That number is greatly decreased when it comes to college. So I want you to think about that. Why don't they teach you how to do taxes in high school? They know that you're going to go out and get a job. They know that you have to pay taxes. They know you have to fill out a W-2, W-4, right? Or 1099 of your contract or whatever. They know that you have to pay taxes. Why don't they teach it? Why don't they at least teach you to understand it? Why they don't teach you the loopholes? Because they understand if we don't teach you and you have to go do it on your own, you won't do it. That is a form of control, of being in the form. Think about this. Our tax dollars goes to our public schools, go to our public infrastructure to teach our kids, right? So, so we all agree that taxes go to that local area to, uh, you know, fund the school, fund the teachers, whatever, to teach your children. So why aren't those school systems teaching taxes if that's the very thing that the school is funded by? Think about that. Just think about that. Let's move on. Let's move on. Please. Um, what was the cause of the United States Civil War? Well, don't, don't come with an easy me. question or anything. I mean, I, I think the cause of the Civil War was basically how government was going to run, the freedoms and what people could and couldn't do. What do you think the cause of the Civil War was? I'm sorry? She asked, she asked this guy, she said, they asked him, what was the cause of the Civil War? So she gave some cocky, cockamamie sort of answer. And then she asked the gentleman why you think the Civil War happened. He said, I'm not running for president. Good comeback. That was a great comeback. Don't ask me questions. You're running for president. You're supposed to have the answers. I mean, I think it always comes down to the role of government. We need to have capitalism. We need to have economic freedom. We need to make sure that we do all things so that individuals have the liberties so that they can have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to do or be anything they want to be without government getting in the way. What do you want me to say about slavery? The here lies the problem. Here lies the problem, family. Hold on for a second. Here lies the problem. So the gentleman basically responded and stated, I cannot believe you said all of that about the Civil War and you didn't mention slavery. And then her comeback was, well, what do you want me to say about slavery? He's, and then he said, never mind, you answered my question. He knows she's ignoring the fact. And then good old Joe at the top, he's talking about it was about slavery. Then cut the check then, nigga. Cut the check then. If you, if you know the Civil War was about slavery, if you know that black people's land was stolen, if you know that the state and federal level sanctioned slavery and sanctioned redlining and, and sanctioned bombing of our cities in our prominent black business district, then cut the check. Why is it that everybody is okay with black people being poor? Why is it everybody is okay with black people dying at the hands of race soldiers with and without badges? Why every why is people, even black people, even black people, see, that's what I can't get down with, family. I can't get
I remember when I went to his bedroom to say goodnight and he was crying because of the abuse that he was enduring in this school system. Then why didn't you stay in Mexico?
I guess I was out of sound for a guy. I'll thank, thank for somebody telling me when you don't check, uh, take your check. I was saying a lot of good stuff there, family. Um, I hate that I'm going to have to probably cut that out and redo the video. But um, as I was stating here with the different statistics of crime, that black Americans, they fear the most when it comes to excessive crime, to excessive force being used. They say about one in 11 black Americans say law enforcement is currently using the correct amount of force. And that's only 9%. That's your Candace Owens, your Larry Elders, your uh, Jeffrey Petersons, your uh, uh, Thomas Souls, and people of that nature. Uh, th thank you, Jermaine. I appreciate it. Very few Americans believe that police officers should be using greater force. That's where we are. And here we are right here when we talk about the different statistics. 78% of black Americans see deaths of black Americans, excuse me, yeah, black Americans encounters with police in recent years as part of a larger problem, not isolated um, incidents. 63% of fear police is greater than 21% fear from white folk. Yeah, so this fear that we essentially have, people are talking about white on white crime, black on black crime. Listen, family, throw out that racial uh, trope. Throw out that racial narrative because the problem that we have, the problem that we have is a very systemic problem that we need to really break down and understand. Um, we have certain issues like reports about police shootings of unarmed black American have frequently been in the news most recently announcement that officers involved in Sacramento shooting of Stephen Clark will not be charged. So the police officers that killed Stephen Clark, who was an unarmed black American male, will not be charged. See, police doesn't have fear of black people. No, they don't. No, you, no they don't. They've used, they've used that same phrase to justify the killing of an unarmed black person. I feared for my life. I thought he had a gun. I thought she had a gun. This is what they have used to kill, the, to kill us unjustly. Black Americans appear to be more worried than whites about crime. They are the most likely group to believe that crime in general is a very serious problem nationally. Just about half say that crime has increased in the country in the last year. 38% say it has gone up in their own communities. See, family, when you have the, this fear-mongering spirit, when you have this fear-mongering um, um, energy that has been instilled through us, through different many, um, um, different many sources, whether it be instilled by your parents, about you learning about your history, about your encounters with um, white supremacists and people who are anti-black and racial discrimination on the workplace and racial discrimination in healthcare, racial discrimination in our environments, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, by our water, our water facilities um, not being fixed and updated so there's no lead and poison in the water. We still have a lot of black cities with issues okay we have a lot of black cities with issues when it comes to water we have a lot of black cities who still have toxic water coming through their pipes yeah we still have we still have issues with water in america we still have issues with water in america but i want you i want to point this out instead of the federal government coming to these black cities to tear down, to renovate, to fix these water uh, filtration systems, these water filtration facilities with a couple of million dollars here and there, we will give billions of dollars for illegal immigration. We will give millions and billions of dollars to illegal immigration on a city, state, and federal level. We will give billions of dollars for other people to fight their battles, to fight their wars, to fight their conflicts. And, and, and by the way, some of these conflicts that America is funding, whether it, whether it be in Europe or would it be in the uh, region of the Muslim world, the Middle East, just know 
Not only are they using your tax dollars, but they're even using the tax dollars of your children and your children's children because America is on their verge of $34 trillion in debt and counting. And counting. Consequently, despite the concerns about police violence, when given the option, Black Americans want more police present in their communities as opposed to less 15% may be fearful of potential injury by police, but there is also concern about crime. I want you to think about that. I really want, I really want you to think about that. I really want you to think about Black Americans want more police present in their communities because they are fearful of the crime in their communities. And then they turn around and say, well, many may be fearful of the potential injury by police in their community as well. So you want the police and you, at the same time, you don't want the police. That is the problem that we're having currently. That is the problem that we have in currently family. That fear is operating, that fear is operating in our minds rent free. That fear is operating in our minds rent free. And just in case that you missed it, and just in case that you miss it, you got to hear this again. Please, um, what was the cause of the United States Civil War? Well, don't come with an easy question or anything. I mean, I think the cause of the Civil War was basically how government was going to run, the freedoms and what people could and couldn't do. What do you think the cause of the Civil War was? I'm sorry? I mean, I think it always comes down to the role of government. We need to have capitalism. We need to have economic freedom. We need to make sure that we do all things. The question is who you who you voting for president because it, when we look at it, no one's for us. Unless you're putting something on the table for black Americans, nothing is for us, family. No, nothing is for us. Nothing is for us. I want you to look at this statistic very quickly. I want you to look at this statistic very, very quickly. Quickly, this states here. Uh, let me go up just a little bit here so you can get some context. Give me one second. I thought I had it highlighted for you guys. Give me one second. It states that the first research shows the brain continues to mature until at least a person's mid twenties, while emerging adults have more cognitive development than some under. 18, they still possess youth-like attributes of impulsivity risk-seeking, and impaired judgment. Though emerging adults have specific needs based on their level of development, they rarely receive developmental appropriate services. Entering their emerging adult years means, ex uh, excuse me, exiting public education and losing access to many other publicly funded programs. Equipping communities with tailored approaches for emerging adults will have an outsized impact on how justice systems, including reducing unnecessary encounters with law enforcement, okay? Now, when we come down here, we're looking at uh, black people are represented in blue, Latinas are represented in green, and white people are represented in tan. And what they're showing you here are police killings, a young adult perspective. They're showing you that our young men and women are getting killed. It says right here, Black 24-year-olds are killed by the police officer at a rate of 127 per, per capital of 1,000. Uh, excuse me. Of, um, I was all off. I'm sorry. 100,000, family. That is, that is the problem right there. So they're killing us at a higher rate at a younger age than any other people. And it goes on to say, unfortunately, these disparities continue and even increase as emergent adults, uh, they say adults of color, but black adults go deeper into the legal system. In 2018, black emerging adults were 20 times, 20 times, 20 times as likely to be incarcerated as white males, and Latinos were about five times as likely. A longitudinal study and analyzing 
arrest data from 1997 to 2008 found that nearly 50% of black males and 44% of Latino males are arrested by the age of 23. They found that nearly, they found that nearly 50% of black males and 44% of Latinos are arrested by the age of 23. So when they ask us what we are fearful of, we're fearful of a lot of things, regardless if we would like to conclude to that or not. That, that is the reality that we live in, okay? Fatal police shootings of unarmed black people reveal a troubling pattern, okay? I got to have this light over here washing me out. I should have closed my window. I do apologize, family. But when we look at this, this is what you hear. This is a protest. Hands up, don't shoot. This is back in 2014 in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, with the death of Michael Brown. Let's, 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 let's dive into this. The gentleman to your right here, he was also killed, an unarmed black male. Ronald Foster was fatally shot by California police officer Ryan Mahone in 2018 after being stopped for riding his bike without a light. Foster was unarmed. See, anything that you can uh, bring up in this country, family, that's a shining light right there, isn't it? Anything that you can bring up, family, when it comes to black people in general being killed for nothing, this young man was riding his bike without a light, and he was killed. He was fatally shot by the police, and he was unarmed. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just simply... Riding his bicycle without a light. If anything, that is a ticket. That is a repair ticket for you to go put a light on your bike. But that's not our reality. So our fear, our fear is not something that we imagine. Our fear is not something that we divulge. Our fear is not something that we conjured up. Our fear is our reality, unfortunately. But instead of feeding our fear, we need to counter and combat our fear. We can no longer live in a state of fear. We can no longer live in a state of fear. It states here, at least six officers had trouble past before being hired onto the police departments, including drug use and domestic violence. One officer had been fired from another law enforcement agency, and at least two others were forced out. I want you to think about that. When you, when you guys get fired from your job, depending on how you get fired, they, you have to sign a paper or they will never hire you back. They give you a, a severance payment or whatever. They will never hire you back, but not for police. Not for police. One officer had been fired from another law enforcement agency and at least two others were forced out. This is a perpetuated cycle within the system of policing and law enforcement that if you get fired from one police department, just go to the next closest police department and they get hired. Oh, they give them second and third and fourth chances to kill and hurt and, 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 and terrorize black folk. Let me move on. Several officers were convicted of crimes while on the force, such as battery and resisting and obstructing. What do they mean by obstructing? Obstructing what? What, what? what is the police officer obstructing? I want you to think about that. What, what they're basically saying when they say obstructing, okay, several officers were convicted of crimes while on the force, such as battery. That means assaulting people that they're probably encountering with. Resisting, I have no idea in this context, and obstructing. Obstruction of justice. They're planting drugs on black folk. They, they, they are, are locking you up if you get it smart with them. They're punching in your face while you're handcuffed. Black people are getting injured, killed, palm up. All the, where is this fear coming from? Whether it be political fear, social fear, uh, uh, justice fear, there's all sorts of fear that we live in. There. But I'm telling you this. We have to stop living in a state of fear because it's hindering us. It's hindering us from being who we are. It's hindering us from our great history. It's hindering from our great future. It's hindering us. It's stopping us. It's a barrier that we have to see past. And a lot of us, 
really don't even know that we fear these things until we fear them. You don't, we don't fear them until the situation arrives and then you have this overcoming feeling of fear. And I'm not just stating when it comes to law enforcement. What about politics? What about politics? And, and a lot of this has to deal with the different variations of allegiances that people have. That's what it has to do with. It has to deal with the very different variations of allegiances that people have. Think about this. If you have your allegiance to the Democratic Party, anything negative that they say about the Republican Party, you're going to hang on every single word. Donald Trump is the boogeyman. Donald Trump is going to come in and let all the races out. You guys are going to be hooping and hollering. And, and believe it or not, it's a sense of fear. Let me tell you why I, I believe this is fear more so than you're choosing the best or you're choosing the least of two evils. Why don't black people listen to both parties? Because if you were like me and you listen to both parties of what they say and what they don't say, then until they put something on the table, a brother ain't voting because it's not even worth my time. More than two dozen officers have racked up citizen complaints or use of force incidents. At Fort Lauderdale, Florida, police officer had 82 reviews of use of force and incidents, but was never found in violation. 82 reviews, and no one was found in violation. A Vinland, New Jersey officer had more than three dozen of force innocent over a five-year period. He had more than three dozen. That's 36. More than 36 incidents. It also states that several officers have violated their department policies and been cited for ethics violation, including a Hollywood, Florida officer accused of trying to steer business to his company and an Arizona state trooper accused of misuse of state property. Yeah. See, what they don't tell you about all the, the degeneracy that they have in these police departments and how they keep their jobs. We'll let you, let you go through something like that as well. Give me a second here. This is the one thing that's protecting police officers. Every single time they killed an un unarmed or unprovoked black male, an unarmed or unprovoked black woman, this is what they have in their protection. The most that these police officers in, the, in law enforcement agencies endure is being fired. I want to make something, I want to make something very clear here. This is not anti-police. This is anti-bad policing. This is anti um, racial policing and, and racial profiling. That's what this is. We need the police now. Shit. We got criminals of all colors and all walks of life. Yeah, 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 yeah. We just need good police. That's all. We just need good police. But what they don't understand is, is that the, the, the bad police seems to outnumber the good police. But regardless of the fact, they have qualified immunity to protect them. Why are police protected from civil lawsuits? See, they're protected. Ben Crump, good old Ben Crump. He's talking about the George Floyd killing there. Okay. Let me show you some other things here. Uh, it says as of June 22nd, the database of uh, fatal police shootings show 14 unarmed black victims and 25 unarmed white victims in 2019. The database does not include those killed by other means. Ah, and see, I want you guys to be very crafty when you're looking at these statistics, because we have to understand that black Americans were only 15%, 15% of the population. We're roughly 50 million in this country. Whites are still at 60, 63% of, uh, uh, of the population. And when I say 60% plus white, I mean non-Hispanic, okay? Non-Hispanic. And when they give you simple numbers like this, 14 versus 25, some people are like, oh, but there have been more white victims in 2029. 
What we now have to only understand, we're talking about unarmed black men, right? And it also states here that last sentence, the database does not include those killed by the other means. So when you take, when you take 63%, okay? When you take 60, let's say 25, let's say take 63. Give me one second, family. I want to do the math very, very quickly, okay? Because if you're 60 some percent of the population and you give me a simple number and you don't give me the answer in percentages, then this number is fraudulent because you're showing me a hard, simple number based upon a population versus 14 at a smaller population, only 15% versus 60 something percent, meaning that blacks who are unarmed are disproportionately killed at damn near 10 times the amount of the larger society. So don't, don't, don't try to fool me with these simple numbers. That's what they try to do every time they give you statistics. So you got to comb through this stuff, family. There are about 7,300 black homicide victims a year. The 14 unarmed victims and fatal police shootings will compromise only zero point, excuse me, only 0 0.2 of that total. Ideally, officers would never take anyone's life in the course of their duties, but given the number of arrests they make each year, around 10 million, and the number of daily weapons attacks on officers, average around 27 per day in just two-thirds of the nation's police departments. This is when they start explaining. It is not clear that these 1,000 civilian shooting deaths suggest that law enforcement is out of control. Let's move on. Black people, um, and this is from a Harvard study, for, for the people who want, want me to cite my sources. And let me go back. Let me go back. Let me cite my sources. You know how people like to, you know, cite there. So let me go down here, cite my sources. Where are we at? Are we here yet? Where are these sources coming from? I know people are like, where are you getting your information from? This is NPR, National Public Radio. That's one. I'm going back inside my sources because I know this video, a lot of people are going to try to combat what I say. That's fine. Let me cite my sources so because I know lazy people and people who say, you're just race baiting. You're race hustling. You're trying to fool people. You do videos on white. You do videos on white privilege and racism all the time. You're just giving us the statistics that agree with your narrative. What I'm about, why can't I just give you statistics that is the truth? See, that's how they're always trying to water down with um, people in the black empowerment and black media state. We're just trying to water down these things, but we're giving you statistics that your institutions provide. I didn't go knock on everybody's door and ask these questions. I didn't go to all the police facilities and gather all this information and compile the numbers and come up with this. No, this is from your institutions, just like Harvard University. Just like Harvard University. Harvard says black people more than three times as likely as white people to be killed during a police encounter. So that last article you read was a counter of their previous one. So don't forget what this states right here. Let me, let me come back up for you, family. Look what this title says. There is no epidemic of fatal police shootings against unarmed black Americans. Like, no, there's no, there's no, there's no epidemic. You got these race hustles on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram just trying to cut for the bag. They're not trying to inform you guys. They're not trying to empower you guys. They're not trying to teach you guys how to combat the system of white supremacy and the injustice by the race soldiers with badges. No, 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 no. They're not trying to teach you about those things. These race hustles talking about black empowerment, foundation of black America and U.S. freedmen. They, 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 they don't, they, they just trying to race hustle. They're not giving you true statistics. Well, this is... There is no epidemic of fatal police shootings against unarmed black Americans. But then Harvard comes and say black people more than three times as likely as white people to be killed during a police encounter. Black Americans are 3.23 times more likely than white Americans to be killed by the police, according to a new study by researchers from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Of course, they took some research exam numbers, and you can go read this for yourself. Study shows, uh-oh, they hate that word when you say study shows. 
Race is a substantial factor in wrongful convictions. Well, I, I, guess, I guess the question is this. How do you destroy the black family? Well, first of all, you, you take away the black male and you incarcerate him. And once incarcerated, uh, you put him in uh, con uh, solitary confinement for the damnedest reasons. So if a black man wasn't a criminal before he went in, he, uh, there's a strong chance he would become a criminal while he's in. Think about that. You know how many second time and third time offenders are in jail who were innocent? Think about that. You're, you're in the penitentiary, you're in prison with some people who have committed these heinous and uh, these very eye-opening crimes. If you don't think prison really fosters and create criminals, then I want you to speak to the people who were wrongfully accused. See, there, there's a lot of the dis disproportionate and disenfranchised, but at the end of the day, it's fear. Why are you thinking they're killing black people disproportionately? Why do you think that black people have the highest wrongful con conviction rates in America if it's not fear? What are they fearing? That's my question. What are they fearing? That's the question that I have for you. We still have a large proportion of our black males in jail because of fear. Because of fear. They tell us, a land of opportunity, they say. But for black Americans, the promise often comes tangled with a barbed wire fence. That's called prison. A barbed wire fence of fear. Fear fueled by a narrative woven into the very fabric of the society. A narrative that thrives on division and profit from keeping us scared. Politicians keep us scared. Policemen keep us scared. Our employers keep us scared. Our, our medical facilities keep us scared. Democrats, they play the empathy card. Oh, yeah, we know that you guys went through slavery. We know that you guys and your ancestors went through so many things. And we understand that the police are brutalizing your black youth and, and, and social media entertainment. The entertainment sector is making your men gay and um, um, confusing your new generations of what they should be. There's so much. I want you to think about that. Mass media. The entertainment sector, what has it done to? I mean, I just saw, I just saw a, a news article that had Tyrese, Tyrese, up on the cover in a dress. Now, people put on a cape for Tyrese and stated that this was not a dress. Um, this was some sort of religious garment. This was like a Muslim or a religious garment. Um, he was, I believe he was in the Middle East. I don't have that piece up right now. This is coming to me just now, family. Um, but I, I'll look for it because I, I think we should, we should briefly speak about it. We should briefly speak about it. But yeah, Ty, Tyrese was in a dress and it was a, a news story and he's the only man up there in the dress. And by the way, he was the only black man on the stage as well. And, um, this is pretty because for all of a sudden, all these black people, are now coming out wearing dresses. While all the men are looking masculine, they're now having the people we thought, okay, and I still to this day do not know. Still to this day, I do not know, um, you know, which way the brother swings, which I do not care. But at the same time, it's emasculating black men. It's emasculating black men. You know, it's giving us the stigma. It's giving people the perception of such a thing. And we have to we have to nip these narratives in the bud. I'm trying to get to here we go. I wanna I wanna show where uh, Tyrese here, right? He's wearing this dress, but he was on a panel with all these other Middle Eastern men, these Middle Eastern white looking men, and where people are stating. So you have some people saying it's a religious garment. Um, you had some people stating that. Um, 
it's not a religious garment because they put on a blazer. Now it's a dress because you can't deface. Okay. You can't defame the religious garment by covering it up. It should just be wearing as is. Um, but here's my thing. I don't know Tyree's religious preference. Um, but I can tell you in black American culture, that's a dress. In black American culture, that's a dress. Now, if he said it's a sort of religious garment, then by trying to, I don't want to say period up or make it more professional, you put on a blazer, thus it's no longer a religious garment because that's not how it's worn. Okay, that's the improper wear of it. You just made it a dress, brother. That's all that is. You just made it a dress. Okay? Now, going back to this study right here, let me, let me dive into some things here. This study basically goes over while black Americans are seven times more likely than white Americans to be falsely convicted of serious crimes. Falsely convicted of serious crimes. If we truly think about that, these are not just disparities. These are attacks. Have you ever, guys, have you ever, um, guys, just thought that black people in general, especially here in America, that we are under attack. And we have been. So when I when I look at other groups, right? I was looking at a, a news clip in the day. It, it was the gentleman from the Young Turks. Him and another gentleman was on Piers Morgan speaking about the um, you know, Palestine, Hamas, Israeli conflict. And one of both of them were basically throwing around the word genocide thrown around the word genocide. We know there has been many genocides in America. You, you know one thing that we haven't really used is genocide. We are survivors of a genocide. We are survivors of a mass raping. And, and see, raping is just not of sexual nature, but it includes it as well. A raping of everything we hold dear. You took a people from a continent, you took people who look like us that were already here, and you separate us from our loved ones, you separate us from our land, you separate us from everything we hold dear, and you mixed and matched us together, and you made us work in the harshest, hottest, brutal conditions imagined to man. And you gave us the scraps off your table and the uh, worn clothes off your back to work for free for generations. And your families got paid and the country became rich. And because of power, because of power, Abraham Lincoln said, you know what? Let's free the slaves. You think Abraham Lincoln just woke up one day and was like, Oh, you know, four score and seven years ago, our great nation. No, he, he didn't get up and stop prophesying. He, 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 he didn't do that. He didn't just all of a sudden have this insightful moment. He didn't have this omen of a thought and be like, oh, you know what? I think it's a good idea that we let the, uh, those uh, enslaved people free. He said, we want to form the United States of America. And that America should look as me as his one and true president. This was about power, family. And he realized he had a whole military force in shackles. He realized he had a whole military force who was trying to make a claim and state and prove themselves through this racist society of the country that they were building. That's why the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. That's why the, abolish, the abolishment of slavery in that form was abolished, because slavery still exists by the way of incarceration. Look at the Constitution. That's why Abraham Lincoln fleed the slave flame. He, 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 he didn't feel it because God tapped him on his shoulder and said, let my people go. God didn't do that to Abraham Lincoln. This was for power. This was for the wealth of the South, because... The South had majority of the slaves. Again, there were slaves all throughout America, but the South had majority of the slaves, and they wanted to separate from the North. 
So when we look at Nikki Haley and her absent-mindedness, her selective amnesia of the cause of the Civil War was slavery, and then good old Joe coming in, it was about slavery. Okay, Joe, if the Civil War was about slavery, then cut the check. Cut the check. That's where I'm at, family. Now we got our brothers out here in dresses. Fear. Fear. And here, here's, here's one more thing, too. There's a lot of fear. Uh, believe it or not, family, we... There's a lot of freedoms, supposedly, that the Constitution gives us protection. What about the First Amendment right? Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. If you come out and if you denounce the acts of the Israeli Air Force, of the Israeli military force, on the mass killings of Palestinians, they will call you anti-Semitic. Because if you had this conversation, you cannot be pro anything. And this is why I'm telling black Americans, stay out of it. Stay out of these conflicts. Let the black media inform you. Let us teach you. But stay out of these conversations online. They will greatly, because there's a fear that you will lose your job. And also a reality. See, when, 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 when Nick Cannon had a uh, come to Jesus moment and what he said sounded to be anti-Semitic, they stripped him away of his status. They stripped him away of the bag. They stripped him of the way he uses his talent to feed his uh, family. So he had to go on an apology tour. See, there's no freedom of speech for black folk, unfortunately. I know this is a contradicting uh, sort of video because on one hand, we shouldn't be fearful. And on the other hand, there's a fear that they have been putting in front of us. There, there's a fear that they have instilled. When Kyrie Irvin came out, when Kyrie Irvin came out and simply posted a movie on his social media. His marketers, his endorses, his uh, social platform teams, they all dropped him because the Jewish community came out and stated that what he posted, he didn't say anything, was anti-Semitic. Everybody applauded Kanye West on his comments. That wasn't a good look. There's a certain way to do things and there's a certain way not to do things. See, the thing about it is, family, anytime that you attack a problem with truth, anytime that you attack a problem with truth and you're not being divisive, you're going, you're going to come out as a winner. You're going to come out on top. See, there, there's a manner in which you can respect humanity and speak the truth at the same time. So Kanye West is now on a <laughs> apology tour. Kanye West is now on an apology tour. Let me look this up very quick. Give me one second. Give me one second. Kanye West is now on an apology tour. They said the brother apologized in Hebrew. He want to make sure that it was heartfelt. Kanye West posts Hebrew apology to the Jewish community ahead of Vultures. Uh oh, here we go. Here we go. Let me see if I can get this out the way. To so Jewish community ahead of Vultures album release. So he's about to release an album. But before he released his album, he had to apologize to the Jewish community because they're like, we're not going to let, because you know, there's a certain percent of uh, Jewish Americans that own a large portion of the entertainment sector, especially in hip hop. So he had to come out because it's going to hurt the bag. A Kanye West, I don't know if he's even a billionaire anymore. I mean, who really cares when you're not even a millionaire? Like he got all the money regardless. But at the same time, 
Kanye West and come out on top. This this was a bad move by Kanye West. People was applauding him. I, I didn't think it was a good idea. But here's what I'm talking about. This is another point of fear. But at the same time, you can speak the truth non-divisively. And you speak in matter of factly and not all over the place and all of these sort of hidden, uh, these very uh, cloak and dagger words, camouflage statements. They're reading right through all that bullshit. You can't do that. You can't do that. But you can, you can call out the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can call out the truth all you want. But yeah, Nick Cannon, Kanye West, the only person who didn't apologize. Oh, I take that back. I believe Kyrie Irving did apologize. And I think it was like a somewhat of a, a indirect or, or um, a, a passive apology. I'm trying to find that very quickly. Give me one second. I, I, think, it's, I think it's notable to see very quickly. Because of the way he kind of apologized. Let's see. Let's see what he says here. For his for her his actions call. So yeah, yeah. So even so even uh Kyrie Irving apologized. Kyrie Irving returned to the Brooklyn Nets. Here we go. On Sunday and apologized to anyone who felt threatened or hurt when he posted a link to a documentary with anti-Semitic material. Irving was suspended by the team on November 3rd. Hours after he refused to say he had no anti-Semitic beliefs. Irvin had missed eight games on the suspension, which the Nets said would be for a minimum of five games without pay. So he posted a documentary on his social media, Kyrie Irvin. And they suspended him from basketball. What does a brother on his Twitter of a documentary that he saw posted on his social media has to do with basketball? He, he wasn't like J Draymond Green where he's, choking somebody or he's hitting somebody or he's undercutting somebody or he's elbowing somebody or he's choking somebody. It took all of that for Draymond Green to get suspended. I thought Draymond, and, and again, I, I like Draymond Green. I think he's a, a phenomenal player, but you can't be doing the things he's doing. He's damn near um, um, assaulting people on the court. Some people are like, he should be locked up. Again, I digress. I don't encourage any black man to be locked up unless you're doing harm to children and you're killing people. But again, you know, he up here um, doing incidents and violent situations on the court and he will get, I don't know, suspended a game, thrown out of a game. But this is the first time that anything substantial has happened, in my opinion. But Kyrie Irving just posted a documentary. He didn't even say anything. And they suspended him from basketball Okay, they suspended him from basketball for eight games. And they told him it would be a minimum of five games without pay simply because he posted a movie. A movie. Then he had to come out and apologize. He stated, he said, <laughs> he said, apologize to anyone who felt threatened or hurt when he posted a link to a documentary with anti-Semitic material. I don't stand for anything close to hate speech or anti-Semitism or anything that is going on against the human race, Urban said. I feel like we all should have an opportunity to speak for ourselves when things are assumed about us. And I feel it was necessary for me to stand in the place and take accountability for my actions because there was a way I should have handled all of this. And as I look back and reflect when I had the opportunity to offer my deep regrets to anyone that felt threatened or felt hurt, but what I posted, that wasn't my intent at all. See, I don't get it, family. There's a, there's a level of fear that we have to understand that is not created by ourselves. We're not creating this fear. This is a multimillionaire who plays basketball who simply retweeted, oh, excuse me, who tweeted about a documentary that he saw. And simply because that documentary had anti-Semitic mature you, they label him as being anti-Semitic. Wow. That's a lot. That's a really a lot to digest because he then had to come out and give a public apology of those who felt hurt by it or threatened by it, by him simply posting, 
You know what? I, I think when it comes to things like this, and of course the black community stood up for Kyrie Irving on this because he didn't do anything wrong. But I understand, again, a lot of times we're selling out for the bag. But again, I don't know all the existential circumstances on why he apologized. Again, it is a love for the game. It's kind of the same way that on one hand, uh, what's, the, what's the fellow's name? Ah, what's his name? The football player, San Francisco, number seven. Uh, he took a knee. What's the guy's name? Anybody in the chat? What's the guy's name? I forgot the guy's name. Man, but anyway, he sued the NFL, then tried to return to the NFL. That's kind of like you, you sue your job for wrongful termination, and then try to fill out another application to go back to your job. The fear. The fear of family. I mean, he could have played in the Canadian League. He could have done a lot of things. He could have been a coach. But there, there's a certain level that we're trying to keep our status. We're trying to keep our fame. We're trying to keep our dollar. And fear has been driving us to make the same ill will decisions when it comes to politics when it comes to criminal justice reform, when it comes to um, health care reform, when it comes to the very vital things in our lives. Fear of success, fear of achieving, fear of taking risks. See, why do we have a fear of bettering ourselves? A lot of times we're sending our kids to college for no reason at all. Like we... We just like, we want them to have a better life so they need to go to college. College is not the end all be all of all things. Trades, college, licenses, certifications is a melting pot of different skills that you're going to need to survive in this new coming age of technology and innovation. And we can't have fear of the unknown. We have already been left behind on every single account. This country is taking care of illegal immigration more so than black folk. This country is allotting billions of dollars to other countries to fight their wars more so than infusing that money into the black community, into the black infrastructure, into uh, police um, wiping away of qualified immunity, and most importantly, and most importantly of all, cutting the check of the reparations that are owed to black Americans to the descendants of the slaves, to the survivors of the genocide of our people. So people are going to use fear and stupidity as a tactic to get your vote. They're going to use it as a strategy. They're going to use it as a tactic to scare you. They're going to tell you, oh, you don't want another four years of Donald Trump. That's when all the racists came out and started inflicting violence on the black community. Well... Let me tell you this, dear Watson. We survived four years of the orange man. And unfortunately, we have, we're, we're, we're surviving four, four years of Joe Biden. Oh, Jim Crow Joe. And this time, I'm pretty sure a majority of black Americans are woke. Shout out to Ron DeSantis. There are a lot of black Americans are woke on the issues that we've been facing for the past hundred, hundred some odd years. Not woke in the terms of, oh, they're woke, so they're into liberalism and they're into the, the LGBT community movement, into transgenderism, into pronouns. That's not woke. That's not critical race theory. See, they created critical race theory to the justification of eradicating black history out of textbooks. That's what critical race theory is about. It's eradicating black history, which includes slavery out of textbooks so they don't feel white guilt. Because if you don't feel white guilt, then you don't have white privilege. You see that? They coincide one another. White guilt begot white privilege. Because if you don't have white guilt, then white people will never believe that they're privileged as we know they are. They would just think the racial narrative that black people are not, in, uh, not as intelligent as white folk or Asian folk or Hispanic folk, that black folk are lazy, not like Hispanic folk, Asian folk, and white people. 
This is all fear-based. So look for this next year coming up. Happy New Year to you all. Look for this. Look for this next year coming up. And how these two political parties are going to play black people like the ping pong. They're going to play some really dark cinematic music. And they're going to give you these statistics about what Biden didn't do and then what Trump didn't do or what the Republican Party passed that hurts black people and what the Democratic Party didn't do to fund black people and help their illegal immigration situations in crisis. They're going to play us as a ping pong. And they're going to just keep passing it back and forth. Because they want you to choose the lesser of two evils. And what they understand is whoever cites, whoever regurgitates the most fear-mongering, the most fear-mongering narratives to our people, they're the ones who will get the vote. See, if they scare us like they have been doing since, since the civil rights movement, since, uh, um, since Martin Luther King sat down with Lyndon B. Johnson and had him to South signed the Civil Rights Act, we've been voting Democrat. And when you look back on it, family, even though these Republican presidents, even though these Republican parties has done nothing for black folk, they still had be better legislation sometimes that could or would have assisted us. These are just some of the things I want you to think about, because again, I'm not telling you to vote Republican. I'm not telling you to vote Democrat. I'm telling you to vote for your best interest. And I'm telling you, from what I see and from where I sit, none of these two parties are in my best interests. So if you look like me, smell like me, um, probably not the smell, but you'll understand from the perspective and stance that I'm coming from. So don't fear no one. Don't fear anything. And don't fear politics and taking a step away for this term, because on one accord, this will have to collapse and fail for people to understand the true gravity, the true gravity of their decision. So at this moment in time, I'm deciding to opt out of the political process on a federal level. When it comes to state level, I believe of uh, nurturing, I believe in empowering, and I believe in monetarily funding those grassroots candidates is going to do something for the black communities in those areas. When it comes to the federal level, reparations, justice reform in the form of uh, taking away qualified immunity and making black American protected class, you can't give me something, I'm gonna give you nothing.